Hello, everyone. My name is Olina Perry, and I'm with Tecola Parks and Rec and the Green Tecola Program. And thank you all for being here in person and online. Um, can you see me? Yep. Um, I just want to say I'm excited to have another one of our Wildlife Wednesdays. This is our pollinator at home with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and our Habitat at Home program. Uh, with Green Tequila, I just want to make note that it is Earth Month. We have tons of opportunities happening in Tequila. I will be sending everyone an email with a link to Earth Month. We've got this workshop tonight. We've got restoration work parties. We have a city nature challenge that I'm looking to get some folks involved in and a bunch of other fun stuff. So you guys will all see that online. But um, I'm not going to talk too much tonight, but I hope you can come out in the field, join us in one of our beautiful parks. And yeah, if you have any questions, put them in the chat or just throw them out if you're here in person. And uh, look forward to learning about pollinators. So I'll turn it over to Nikki or Leah. Okay, turn it over to Nikki. And I do have some LaCroix and some oranges over here. We have even like a beverage or an order. I don't know if you see the presenter notes. I they no, see them. Do I get everyone see? Okay. No, they can't see you. They can't. Okay, fabulous. They're perfect. Okay. So hi everyone, welcome. Um, so my name is Leah Althauser. I use she her pronouns. Um, I'm the conservation education coordinator for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't choose pollinators, they chose me. Um, a lot of my formal training has actually been in uh, birds. So I've done some avian ecology work and uh, worked with raptors and seabirds uh, in my past life. Um, but after moving over to this job, um, where I've been there for about two and a half years, there's just been this huge need um, for pollinator education. It really was a big emphasis on invertebrate pollinators. And so um, that's what we're going to be talking about today uh, and how you can uh, incorporate more habitat for invertebrate pollinators where you live. No. Can you hear me now, Diane? I can just stand really close. <laughs> yeah, as long as you're closer to Nikki. Okay. So um what I, I don't know if everyone, you know, going back to uh going back to high school or college biology, uh, what is pollination? Um, well, pollination uh, can happen a variety of ways, and we'll talk about that in a second, but it's really when pollen is carried from the anther of the flower and goes into the stigma. Um, and flowers have really unique ways of attracting invertebrate pollinators. And so sometimes that could be the color of the flower, it could be the shape of the flower, maybe the flower has a unique scent. Um, and these can attract flies, butterflies, moths, beetles, all sorts of different, oh, um, all sorts of different types of invertebrate pollinators. And so there's, um, it's not just invertebrates who pollinate. And so one of the main ones I think of is wind pollination. So uh, in the Pacific Northwest in the spring, sometimes you'll see just like a light green coating of dust on everything. That's from our conifers. Um, and and they're, they're really getting wind pollinated. Um, what's interesting, and you'll notice that as you go out and you start to look at plants now, um, plants that are wind pollinated, don't really have any special colors or any special flowers. They really just need the wind to take their pollen and fertilize um, other, other plants. And then the other one, and this one's slightly more rare, um, is water pollination. And water pollination um, is, is it's more rare because in North America, we usually see it with invasive aquatic plants. But essentially the pollen of, of the male plant falls off into the water and then the female plant picks it up. And then finally, we have animal pollination, which is our most common. Um, about 
80 percent uh, kind of varies, but about 80 percent of our flowering plants in the in the globe are pollinated by animals. Now, this could include birds. It could include rodents, so mice, shrews, uh, voles are great pollinators, bats, deer, bears, even humans. Sometimes we accidentally pollinate. Um, so animal pollinators are really important. <laughs> So why, why do we care so much about pollinators? And, and if you've looked at really any uh, ecological news lately, you'll see that there's big concern over decline in abundance of pollinators. Um, and, and scientists and conservationists really are trying to figure out what can we do to help restore pollinator populations. Um, well, just for some, uh, uh, some frame of reference, um, invertebrate species represent about 99% of animal diversity. And so you think of, um, when I think of biodiversity or variety of life, I tend to think of, you know, all the birds and all the, the mammals and uh, the frogs and the amphibians, the things I can see. But really, invertebrates take the cake. In fact, um, some studies say that the biomass of invertebrates is more than or equal to the, the mass of all the other ones. There are a ton of invertebrates. Now, not all the invertebrates are pollinators, but I think it's a helpful frame of reference for us to see um, that we share, our, our world is made up of invertebrates. Now, when you consider that most of our animals on planet Earth are invertebrates, and we're seeing about a 9% decline in, in, in invertebrate insects per year, that's slightly concerning. Is that better? Okay. Thank you. I'm going to read it. <laughs> um, so pollinators visit flowers. They're in search of food. They're in search of a nest. They're in search of mates, um, maybe some shelter building materials. We'll learn a little bit about leaf cutter bees. Um, and the energy, because flowers are really um, enhancing, not just enhancing, they're allowing insect pollinators to survive. And so um, metamorphosis, flight, reproduction, all of the, the proteins, everything they need comes from the flower. And it's really um, a, a mutual relationship as well because the flowers couldn't survive without the insects, the insects couldn't survive without the flowers. And so it's this really mutual uh, beneficial relationship. If one disappears, the other disappears. And we are actually seeing that with a lot of our species of, of greatest conservation need, you know, one butterfly relies on one specific plant and that one specific plant has lost its habitat. And so the, the butterfly populations decline as well. Um, when I think of, of pollinators, uh, you know, I think of all the foods that I like to eat. So I like chocolate, I like avocados. In the Pacific Northwest, we like apples and blueberries. Um, if, if you like a margarita from time to time, you can think of that for pollinating that tequila. Um, these are just, I, I mean, not just for our food, but also our economies. So really our whole way of life revolves around pollinators. Um, and then just to note that um, 75 to 83% of flowering plants globally, um, this really varies um, depending on the study. Uh, so I, I think that that's important to note. Um, but why invertebrates? So uh, somebody, I was telling someone I was here to talk about uh, pollinators and they're like, oh, hummingbirds, I love hummingbirds. Yes, I also really love hummingbirds, but uh, our invertebrate pollinators are so, so, so important, especially bees, and we're gonna get more into that. Um, the importance of insect pollinators for both our, our natural systems as well as our crops has really come to light recently as their ecological function. Uh, we we've become better able to understand it. And we've also started to notice that pollinator populations are dramatically declined. Um, when you think about, well, why are they in decline? Um, insect pollinators are facing a lot of the same pressures that our other uh, species in Washington and really around the, the world are. So a lot of habitat loss and fragmentation, uh, climate change, but another big one that's sort of, um, Slightly unique to insect pollinators is pesticides as well as disease. And so we'll talk a little bit about some things that, that we can do. 
Um, so who are our invertebrate pollinators? And I don't, I'm sorry for folks here. I don't know how to get rid of that, um, that top button, but I don't see that screen on mine. <laughs> um, so just for some frame of reference, um, we have over 20,000 species in Washington that are invertebrates, meaning they don't have a backbone. Now this could be everything from mussels to slugs to, uh, to insects. Um, but I just always find that fascinating because I think the next closest number is like we have 500 something fish. So there's really not even uh, anything close in the ballpark. Uh, insects and invertebrates as well play critical roles in nutrient cycling, soil formation, seed dispersal, water filtration, and they really also serve as uh, the base of the food chain or the food web for a lot of other species. So bats, fish, mammals, birds are eating uh, invertebrates. And so if we weren't to have if it, our invertebrates were to disappear, really our whole ecosystems would collapse. Um, some important invertebrates um, that we're gonna be talking about today, the ones that uh, pollinate other plants, we have ants, bees, and we're gonna talk about both bumblebees, which are social, as well as solitary bees, butterflies, moths, flies, and then wasps. Um, something interesting to note, though, is, is like we have the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife has one pollinator species lead. I just told you about how many like how many insects we think that we have. And so science is always new and it's always um, evolving. We don't even know what species we, we may not know of, and we don't know what species we may be missing. Um, if an extinction were to happen. And so for folks here, I'm sorry, the, the gray is sort of hard to read on this board, but under bees, it says bumble and solitary. Um, and then I always just like to, to think about this quote. Um, it's from uh, the conservationist E.O. Wilson. The truth is that we need invertebrates, but they don't need us. If human beings were to disappear tomorrow, the world would go on with little change. But if invertebrates were to disappear, I doubt that the human species could last more than a few months. Just some important food for thought as we look at this beautiful two-toned bumblebee. And so if you are designing um, a habitat at home or maybe a community space, if, if you're working in the yard or in the garden at all, something to keep in mind um, is this, is this, it's called pollinator syndrome. And that um, we talked sort of briefly about how plants, insects and um, plants have really co-evolved. And so we'll, you can see here, so for example, if you wanted to plant plants for butterflies, you'd want something that was bright. They often like purples and reds. Um, you'd want to make sure that they have nectar guides and we'll talk about those in a minute. Um, they need a faint but fresh odor. Um, the, the limited pollen, and then their flower shape is a narrow tube with a spur or a wide landing pad. And so because so many of our pollinators have adapted and evolved with these plants, you can sort of garden for which pollinators you want to attract. And so we're just kind of um, gonna go through um, all of the different species. I, this is so annoying. Um, we're going to go through some of the different species and I'll, I'll read them for folks um, so that, that we can see them. I'm so sorry. Um, but ant pollination, ant pollination is really interesting. So not all ants are pollinators. Um, some ants are predators that eat other ants. In fact, I like seeing ants in my garden because I know that they're eating the bugs that are eating my, my squash. Um, but some ants actually do can collect nectar from flowers. And the, the, ant, the flowers that they're connecting from, so we have some spurs there in the middle. Um, they're usually uh, low lying plants with, and the flower is usually very close to the stem because if you think if you're a tiny little ant, you probably wanna be able to get into that flower rather easily. Um, one thing that's interesting about ants is that um, ants secrete a bacteria that can actually kill the flower. And so um, there's, there's sort of some drama between ants and flowers. 
flowers don't always like them. Um, so if, if you do have a really uh, bad ant problem and you notice that it's killing your flowers and that's something, um, you know, you maybe you debt, you trim the heads of the flowers. Um, so some ants are beneficial and some aren't. It's just hard to know until, until you monitor. And really anytime you're in your garden and you're looking for pollinators, observations and taking notes, those are the best things you can do, um, especially when we talk about trying to reduce pesticide use. Um, beetles are really cool. They're like the most ancient insect that we have here on earth. Um, and they're also one of the most abundant. So approximately one of every four species of plant, animal, bacteria, or fungus is a beetle. There's a lot of beetles. Um, beetles were also around, um, they were abundant about 200 million years ago. And so they're some of our, our oldest um, pollinating insects. And so they have this really unique relationship with a lot of really um, prehistoric plants. And so a lot of times when you're looking through the literature, you'll see, you know, beetles and magnolias have this really close intimate relationship. Um, they're, if you've heard of spice bush, um, they're important for uh, spice bush. Um, beetles will also eat their way through the petals and other floral parts. And so sometimes you may notice some damage. And this can be, um, so I'm a master gardener intern, and I can say this can be challenging for gardeners is to see plant damage. But knowing how insects and plants have evolved, a little bit of damage is okay. Like if the insects aren't killing the plant, it's usually okay to have insect, some insect damage on whether it's your, you know, um, your vegetable garden or your floral garden. Uh, beetles will also defecate within the flowers. And so um, pollinator biologists will call them the mess and soil pollinators. <laughs> so sort of creating that within. Um, and they are capable of color vision. So beetles really prefer, um, they like the, the light uh, white to sort of gray color scheme. And so you'll typically see them on open flowers um, like the ones behind me. And they rely on their sense of smell for finding flowers and for feeding and laying their eggs. Um, they're associated with uh, crab apples. So crab apples, uh, beetles are a main pollinator of crab apples. Um, and they also like, it's a slightly fermented thing. So sometimes um, if you have crab apples or if you have another fruit tree, leaving some old fruit to rot can help attract pollinators as well. Flies, there's a lot of flies. Um, and interestingly enough, insects are, are insects. Mosquitoes are also considered flies. Mosquitoes pollinate blueberries. Blueberries are one of my favorite fruit. Mosquitoes are one of my least favorite insects. So sometimes you just have to, to fight the, the inner battle. Um, but chewing insects can also include um, flies, gnats. Uh, who likes chocolate? Yeah, yeah, most people like chocolate. Well, you can actually think a fly called a midge for pollinating, uh, for pollinating our chocolate, our cocoa plants. So not all flies are bad. Um, and what's really interesting, though, is there are some flies that are bee, uh, they're, they're bee mimics. And so the one in the middle, the fly in the middle here is a bee mimic. And this helps other predators sort of stay away from them. And then they can go in and they can continue to get the pollen. Um, flies like really putrid, gross smelling things. I mean, we, we, know, we all know house flies, right? And so um, in lower latitudes, not there's a couple plants here uh, in Washington, but in lower latitudes, you get plants that they, you know, they smell like rotting flesh or they smell like the garbage. Those are the ones the flies really go after. Um, you can tell if it's a fly because flies have two wings. They sort of see here, one, two, one, two, one, two. Um, other insects are more complex. And so that's one of the ways you can tell bee mimics apart as well. Um, is a fly will always have two wings. And then butterfly pollination. These are the ones that we love to see in our garden because they're just so dang beautiful. Um, butterflies are usually active during the day. 
Um, and, and the fancy word for that uh, is called diurnal. Uh, and they really visit a variety of wildflowers. Uh, some of the literature says that they really prefer the bright reds and bright pinks, but I've seen them on whites, I've seen them on purples, I've seen them on blues. Yeah. Butterflies see in, in the infrared range. And so the flowers look completely different to them than they do to us. They do. And so um, for folks on the, the screen, he said butterflies can see in the infrared range. And so the flowers that they see look really different to us. And we'll get into that. Um, that's called a lot of times flowers have what do we call nectar guides, which is when the flower actually like points the insect in like land here. <laughs> um, and, and we'll show some photos of what that looks like. Um, Butterflies are less efficient than bees. Really, all of our invertebrate insects are less efficient than bees um, in moving pollen between plants. Um, they don't have a lot of, and the reason bees are so good is they have a lot of fur, uh, it's not fur, but they call it hairs, um, and butterflies just have less of that. But what's really interesting about butterflies is that butterflies have such unique relationships with their host plants. And so butterflies will lay eggs on what's called their host plant. The eggs will, will hatch. And then the, the, the larva, the caterpillar, sometimes they have to eat that one specific host plant. And so a lot of folks know of this relationship because they know of the monarch, you know of monarch and milkweed. So a monarch lays its eggs on the milkweed. The, the monarch caterpillar eats the milkweed. It cannot eat any other plant. But a lot of butterflies have this, again, very unique relationship with different host plants. Sometimes they even have specific nest nectar plants. So after they pupate and they go through their metamorphosis process, they emerge an adult. Sometimes they have to have one specific plant that they have to get nectar from. Um, and so the stories between um, butterflies and plants is also can be really beautiful. Now there are definitely some generalists like the tiger uh, swallow behind me is a generalist. Um, the painted lady is a generalist, but uh, some have that unique relationship. Um, many butterflies produce scents that attract the opposite sex. And so sometimes um, if you're ever walking in a field of wildflowers, you'll see um, a butterfly that will come by and it, it might like, like sort of charge you. It's looking to smell you. And then if you're not a female, which you're not a female butterfly, it'll go back to uh, its flower. <laughs> I mean, you are very special, yeah. Um, moth pollination. Um, moths, just like butterflies, they probe for nectar. We have way more moths in the Pacific Northwest than we do butterflies. There's over 1,200 uh, species of moths. That's quite a few. Um, and uh, most moths are active during um, like dawn, or I'm sorry, during dusk and during night. Uh, they typically, uh, the flowers that are opening at night tend to be uh, white or pale flowers. They have heavy fragrance to attract the moth in. Um, there are a couple uh, of diurnal or daytime moths. And so that's a, 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 a sphinx, no, it's a hawk moth on our far left. Oh, oh pollinating um, a plant. No, it is a hawk moth. I was right. I just said hawk moth. I'm not very good at my moths, I apologize. Um, but they'll fly upward. What's interesting about these moths, they'll fly upward and they're actually smelling for, for their plant, for the nectar plant. And when they smell it, that's when they'll, they'll come and, and probe it. These ones, uh, gardeners hate. Uh, who's heard of a tomato hornworm? Yeah, a couple of us. Yeah, so the caterpillars of hawk moths are tomato hornworms. Um, they are uh, a voracious feeder to some of our nightshades. And really in general, um, you may have heard of like the cabbage white. Uh, I find that I, I, as a gardener, I have the most trouble with moths than I think I do anything else in my garden. Hmm. Go bats. Yes, that's why I, I want the bats. Come on, bats. <laughs> um, some moths or some wasp species are pollinators, not all. 
Um, not all are. Some wasps are also predatory. So they're eating the bugs in your garden that maybe you don't want. Um, they're not fuzzy, uh, like we'll talk about bees are, and they're much less efficient pollinators than bees. And moths don't really, or moths, wasps don't really care. They'll use a variety of, of different flowers to get nectar. And so the, the one in the middle is in, uh, it's a yellow jacket and then nasturtia. Um, so if you're going to use your nasturtium for your salad, make sure there's no yellow jackets inside. Um, they have, I, I always think of, of, you know, pollinators in general, they're eating sugar, right? So a lot of our pollinators have really high energy requirements, which is why they're constantly going from flower to flower. Um, and resources like uh, sugar from the nectar can help them uh, get, that at that high energy can sustain that high energy that they they need their metabolism requirements. Um, so now uh, bee we're going to talk about bee pollinators. Bees are really the ultimate pollinators. In the United States, we have over four thousand species of bee. The one you probably hear about all the time as being an important pollinator is the honeybee, and I hope to change your mind about that today. Um, honey bees are, are great for honey, but our native bees are much better at pollinating anything from the squash in your garden to our wildflowers. Yeah. Can I ask about that? So if, if you have a hive for a honeybee, how does that affect the uh, population in the area? Yeah, so if you have a hive for honeybees, how does that affect the native bee population? Research is really mixed. Um, some areas show significant decline in native bee populations, specifically bumblebees, and other research has shown um, there isn't that much of a difference. And so this is something that scientists are still grappling with. They're not really sure, you know, are they taking over more, are they, are they taking over more nectar resources? Um, there are some areas, so like um, there's a farm up in Fault City that they're a blueberry farm and they have their uh, their hives and their their honeybee hives pollinate their blueberries. Well, you know, could it be mosquitoes or could it be regular bees? Could they be supporting in, in another way? Could they be supporting native pollinators? Yeah, maybe. Um, I, I think that that's something that we're just sort of, we're learning how to tackle. Um, I'm, I'm not saying that honeybees are bad. I'm just saying native pollinators do it better. So it's dependent though on the food sources. Yeah, so abundance of food sources is definitely um, is important. So if you have, let's say, you know, you think about a population of, of bees and then you bring in a whole other population of bees, then you have more competition. Um, and so introducing competition to maybe a population that already isn't doing well or was hit with disease, that's another thing is that European honey bees can bring in disease to native, native bees. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of, of, of sort of questions like this that we're grappling with. But honey bees are, you know, we use them for wax, we use it for, uh, for honey. They're very important economically. So how do we sort of make these, how do we balance these two needs that we have as humans? Does that help? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, get around the guilt. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say one way you could do that is uh, plant a lot of native flowers because again, bees, native bees and native pollinators have that relationship where they've co-evolved together and uh, honeybees might be more likely to go to something like, like a, a cultivar, like a blueberry, than uh, like a, a flowering red currant. So plant a lot of native plants. And you might not just have bees, you might invite other pollinators too. Um, so these are nectar guides. These are what we were talking about um, a little bit earlier. So the pictures on, um, on the left are what we see. The pictures on the right are uh, what a lot of pollinators see. And so you can see how the flower really entices the pollinator into the center. Like, hey, this is where you want to come. This is where you want to land. 
this is where all that sweet, sweet nectar is. Um, so many of the flowers pollinated by bees uh, have a region of low ultraviolet light near the center of each petal. This region appears invisible to humans because quite honestly, our eyesight's not super great. Um, we don't extend into ultraviolet light. Um, bees can detect ultraviolet light um, and the contrasting uh, ultraviolet pattern is called a nectar guide. And so sometimes you can even see though, um, like things that humans can see with the bare eyes, like next time you, you see an iris, look at an iris and how the iris points right in toward the stamen. So there, there sometimes can be uh, human visuals as well. And so this adaptation benefits both the flower and the bee. The bee can more rapidly co collect nectar, so it can move quicker from flower to flower. Um, and then the flower is more efficiently pollinated. Um, so this, uh, the top of this one says invertebrate habitat. Um, and it, right below it, it says loss of fragmentation or habitat. I just went on to Google Maps and took a screenshot um, of, of what uh, sort of our, our mid sound area looks like. You can see, excuse me, it's very, very fragmented. Um, so habitat that pollinators need to survive is shrinking. Um, native vegetation is replaced by roadways, manicured lawns. Lawns are like the worst thing for pollinators, guys. Um, crops and non-native gardens, uh, and as well as increased use in pesticides. Now, when I say pesticides, we'll talk a little bit more about this, but I'm talking about not just um, insecticides, fungicides, um, herbicides, anything that kills is considered a pesticide. Um, the remaining, you know, a lot of this area used to be prairie and meadow. And so the remaining prairie and meadow that we do have becomes really disconnected. And so you have this little invertebrate pollinator that uh, has some flowers that you planted over here that has to get all the way to you over here. You know, it's probably not going to be able to make that journey. And so one of the things that, that our program is trying to work on is we're trying to make, you know, maybe little islands or, or a little pathway so that our bumblebee can get all the way over and uh, pollinate the flowers at your house as well. Um, and, and then we do have some migratory pollinators. You know, monarchs don't live here on, on the east side. They're, they're really west side, vice versa. Monarchs don't live here on the west side. They're very east side specific, but they are migratory. Um, and so they need that uh, habitat connectivity. Um, and then the other thing is changes in phenology. So phenology, again, flowers and insects have co-evolved. And so sometimes we see flowers blooming earlier than um, maybe some of our bumblebee queens are coming out of their nest, or maybe they're blooming later. So the bumblebee, it's warmed up, the flower's not ready to bloom, the bumblebee queen comes out of her nest and she doesn't have any food sources, so she dies. Um, and so these sort of cycles that, that nature has evolved over millions of years to have, they're, they're really being disrupted. Um, but my favorite like end to this really sad story is that human caused <laughs> human caused problems can have human generated solutions. And so we can all be a part of those solutions. And so this was, um, I, I guess just for folks to know, Nikki, our Habitat at Home coordinator started working with us in August of last year. And I've been walking around my neighborhood since she's she's really been like placing these thoughts in my head. And I've been seeing more like really cool pollinator habitat. And so the picture on the far right here is uh, it's my neighbor's yard. And a lot of my neighbors have yards like this where they have the bare soil. We'll talk a little bit about some of these other elements. Um, but you can also have container gardens, you know, let's say you don't live, you don't have a yard, you don't have that space. You can do container gardens or, or you can work with an organization like Green Tequila that's uh, helping to make community spaces where we can all live and thrive. And so part of this is um, we have our, if you're not already, this is my shameless plug for our Habitat at Home program. You get these super cool signs. Um, it's a very easy application. You just sort of have to tell us what plants you have. Do you have any water sources? What does your yard look like? We'd love to see the pictures of it. 
Um, but this is one way that, that we can sort of, we can actually map out how these habitats are being connected and see if this program is actually making a difference. So that's uh, one of the ways that we're trying to help with the and fish and wildlife. But when you're, let's say you're not ready to apply for a sign, um, here are some things that. We have lots of resources for you today, yeah. um, but things to consider is every, uh, every animal, including ourselves, needs four things for habitat, food, water, shelter, and space. And so food for invertebrate pollinators looks like flower, nectar, fermenting fallen fruit, host plants for larva, um, water, you uh, shallow slope for safety so that if a butterfly gets, you know, you don't want a bird bath for a butterfly. The butterfly is going to get in and not be able to get out. So you want some like short, small pans. Bees will use them as well. You want shelter, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, solitary bee houses in a minute, but snags or dead wood. I, I was walking by my neighbors just before I came here and I didn't have my phone, but one of my neighbors has like, like rounds that they just put in the yard below their rhododendrons. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's a great use of dead wood. Um, bare soil, you, uh, so it's kind of hard to see, but the middle picture is just some bare soil with some dead wood. Um, and then space. So uh, sometimes man-made nests can be really useful, but they require maintenance. Um, and then I will just uh, say again, we are we will be having more information on our website coming soon, probably um, by the end of June. So check back to the WDFW website and you'll get more information on pollinator habitat. Cool thing, um, picture on the, I'm sorry, I'm really bad at right and left. Um, picture on the left with the butterflies, this is called puddling. Male butterflies will do this and, and they're actually, they're taking both um, nutrients and water out. Um, and so they collect, they're really, a lot of them are really looking for sodium. And it's typically male butterflies because the male butterflies need the sodium for their sperm to be able to, um, to fertilize the female's eggs. That sodium is a really crucial part of it. Um, so oftentimes when you see butterflies huddling in large groups like this, it's a lot of males. But it's a really cool sight. <laughs> so bee habitat, um, bee ha because we bees, 4,000 bees, they're all gonna be really different, right? Um, so bee habitat is really varied as well. Most bees will excavate uh, nest tunnels in sunny patches of bare ground. Um, and so that's why uh, bare ground, bare soil is really important. They can't get through the, your lawn. Um, others will seek out abandoned beetle burrows and dead trunks or branches. Um, and what, interestingly enough, um, you know, we think about the honeybee that's really social. We think about bumblebees that are also a social bee. But most of our bees here in North America are actually solitary. And so um, we'll go through um, some of these different. Um, so this one right here, this is a um, mason bee. And oftentimes they'll use mud for their nest. This is a leaf cutter bee, so you can actually see the leaf cutter bee taking a, a little leaf into its brown nest. And then this is a picture of what that, they kind of wrap them up and, and lay their eggs in there. And so they're a teeny tiny, you know, maybe like this big of a little leaf all rolled together. Um, and that's the, the cocoon. So you know, carpenter bees maybe, um, carpenter bees will often dig into dead wood, and that's where they lay their eggs. These two, they're kind of hard to see. Um, I can email the slides and they can send them out. So you can see the pictures a little bit better. But these are both bumblebee nests. And so bumblebees nest in the ground. And so you can kind of see some eggs right here. I know it's kind of hard to see, but uh, if you were just walking up on this, like, like it would be very easy to miss and then here um, we have carter bees. And so carter bees will take, sometimes they take like wool from animals. Um, they'll also take uh, plant material. And then that's where they will hear you on mine. Sorry. <laughs> you get your pointer. I know, a pointer. Um, 
So the, the, for folks online, um, in the top right is the mason bee cocoon. Um, the bottom right is the leaf cutter bee. Uh, just to the left of that, we have the um, carpenter bee. They nest in dead wood. And then the two near that uh, are bumblebees. And then the last one are carter bees. And carter bees uh, collect plant material, but they'll also collect animal wool. And so um, what was interesting about this picture I really liked was it was actually sheep's wool that they were building their cocoons out of. Yeah. Can you speak to like, are these bees all hibernating over winter? Are these, you know, about nests and eggs, but like, how are they distinct from season? Yeah, so the question was, are these bees hibernating over winter? How are they existing from season to season? They all have different strategies. <laughs> um, Bumblebees, queen bees, well, um, the queen bee will go and hibernate underground over winter. She'll come back out, she'll find her, she'll get her pollen, she'll uh, start laying eggs. And the first eggs she lays are workers. Now in bumblebees, um, if you ever say somebody is a worker bee, you better be talking about a female. Because um, all worker bees are females, all male bees are drones. And so she'll uh, she'll start laying uh, she'll start laying workers first. The workers will go out collect more pollen, and then she'll start laying drones. Um, she will right before she dies, she will lay another queen. That queen will then hibernate, and sort of the, the system starts all over. Uh, other bees they, they will lay their cocoons. Um, they will lay their eggs in a cocoon, and they will overwinter. And then the new bees will hatch the following spring. Yeah. Well, it's funny while for mason bees, they were promoting trays made of plastic and then cornstarch. I've not seen those anymore. Are you aware of a problem with them? Yeah. So he said for quite a while, um, mason bees, they were promoting um, trays of plastic with cornstarch. We will get all into bee houses. Yeah, we have a whole section on bee houses, which actually might even be next. Oh, okay. yeah. Come on, Don. So bee houses like this one, and I'll pass this one around so all of you can see, are becoming really popular. Mm -hmm. um, you can you can buy them. I I bought this one from a, a company up in uh, oh I want to say Wilsonville, but I'm thinking Oregon. Woodland, Wood, Woodenville. I bought this from a company in Woodenville. Um, and they have both bamboo shoots, they have paper shoots. Um, folks, they are not set and forget. You can't, you can't leave them and then never attend to them again because otherwise you are setting those bees up for failure. Um, so like if you walk away with one thing from this, it's that native bees are awesome and the Bee houses are not set and forget. So I guess two things. Um, so you have to clean the cocoons. So the, the little tubes that I have, I have one of those for the camera. So the little tubes here, you can kind of see um, they're open on one end and then they're closed on the other. Um, these uh, have to be cleaned. And so when you when you're doing mason bee houses, you actually have to harvest the cocoons. Um, so sometimes people will cut them. Um, well, actually, that would be the only way. Or you could use paper ones that you could rip. But with these bamboo ones, you do actually have to cut them. Um, and then you store the cocoons somewhere, um, like maybe in a garage or somewhere, and then you release them in the spring. And it's actually called harvesting mason bees. It's sort of an interesting process. Um, so there's a little bit more to it than just than just letting it be and le than just letting it go. <laughs> um, because what happens is if you don't clean these, you're making them susceptible to a parasites. Parasites can get in and they'll eat the larva, or you're making them susceptible to disease. So we we know that we have cold, wet, rainy winters here, um, and the cold, wet, rainy winters. Fungus loves it, right? Like we have an abundance of fungus here in the Northwest. So um, there's actually a, a fungus that kill will kill these, which is why we don't use the plastic anymore because the plastic uh, grows that fungus uh, exponentially. Yeah. You might have to put a mesh guard on the front because if Northern 
the liquors find them, they'll just clean them out. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. 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 absolutely. So he said you might have to put a little mesh guard on the front because if birds or um, sometimes even uh, wasps will will get in there and they'll clean them out. Yeah, and so what that is absolutely right. So if you if you find that your your bee house is being preyed on, um, the one thing that they ask is, and I, I tried to find a way, is that you put the mesh. You don't put the mesh directly against the cocoons because bees have to be able to fly in and out. They sort of, like a plane. They sort of need a landing strip, and so make sure that your uh, your little cocoons are not touching the wire. Mm -hmm. Oh, one more question. Mm -hmm. Is that made of cedar? I was I kind of told that cedar isn't used for insect. It's not cedar? Okay. It yeah. harder. I don't know if that one's cedar or not. So, it's yeah, I heard you're not supposed to use cedar to make your box. Oh, do you Because it's a pest re reappellant. Mm -hmm. For moss, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a good point. I, I don't know that one, and I will have to look into that more. I have a, no, I have a quick question. Yeah. So, and, wow, I had no idea. I thought it was set in for me. I'm not going to lie. Learn. Taking it away. Thank you. Like, I will tell everyone I know. And like, you are, you are, those people are not going to make it. But, so, like, this seems like a lot of work. So, how do you do that? Because you've got a little area where you can do it naturally. How do you do it? Yeah. So, the question was, the bee houses seem like a lot of work. Um, They're probably once or twice a year a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Um. But other than that, like it's not like you have to constantly be monitoring them unless you want to, because you want to see all the really cool bees. Um, I just making habitat, so like making sure, which actually let's just go to the next one. So like making sure that you have uh you have if you want mason bees, you have mud nearby. Um, if you want bumblebees, you have that bare soil. If you want carpenter bees, maybe you have some dead uh you have some dead wood. So there are different ways, you know, look into what kind of bees you want to attract and then how you can build that into your habitat without using one of these by um, adding that element to your, uh, to your yard, which in, this is my personal opinion, not a professional opinion. That almost seems better to me because I'm, I'm like, guys, I'm super low maintenance. I hate cleaning things. Yeah. And so if I could like have a snag or I could have some bare soil, um, I would personally much rather do that. But that being said, like some people, they enjoy the process of this. And then what is really cool about these is that you do get to see the cocoons and you sort of get to see that life cycle. So if you have little ones in your lives, like, oh my gosh, that's the coolest science experiment ever. Um, or if you just want to learn more about the bee life cycle, it could also be really neat. Um, but for solitary bee houses as well, um, make sure you have a clay rich mud. They really, you know, we went back, going back to this picture in the upper right, they need that clay. Um, you want open blooms. If you're going to invite them in, you should probably give them dinner as well. You want to make sure they're well fed. Um, they need temperatures pretty consistently of, above 55. And actually, I saw my first bumblebee today. So pretty excited. Spring is here. Um, we also ask that, that you, you know, use, try to take a pledge not to use pesticides. Uh, pesticides really kill uh, our, our invertebrate pollinators. And there's many different alternatives, um, such as, you know, uh, like ladybird beetles and lace wings. If a one thing that's really interesting, I just read this study uh, a couple months ago. If a pesticide says that it's a greener pesticide, you need to compare it to the not greener pesticide. <laughs> because what pesticide companies do is they're marketing to people. They're like, these people want to kill all of the bugs. These people don't want to kill the bugs. But when you look at the back, they have the exact same ingredients. Um, and so, so that can be pretty disheartening, but just really encouraging you to check the back of your pesticide bottles just based on the way it looks is not enough. Yeah. There's an uh, acronym OMRI, mm -hmm. and I think that's the standard for what's good news. Yeah. I forget what that stands for. <laughs> I don't remember either. But, Homework. 
Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Thank you. There's a. Uh, the question was there's an acronym OMRI, and I don't remember what it stands for either. So maybe Diane or Kelsey can look it up really quick. Um, and then also like if you're gonna do one of these, like it's a little bit more work. So like observe it. You know, that's a I I'm I'm just a science nerd. I, I love seeing animals. Um, so it could be a, a neat project for you in your garden. Um, other ways, you know, I, uh, for a really long time, didn't have access to a yard or to a community space. Um, and so th there are other ways, if, 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 or maybe you do have access, but when you see pollinators, report them. Um, so we have a couple of links that we'll drop in the chat. And if you're in person, uh, Elena will share with you later. Um, but one of the, the, really common themes with invertebrates is like more research is needed. We don't know. So when you go to our report and observation, uh, you will submit, you, it's preferable to have a picture if you just report an observation without a picture. That's a little bit harder for our biologists to look at it and know. And quite honestly, it probably won't get used. But if you're able to get a good picture and you can submit it, it will go directly to our biologists who can then identify it. One of the questions I had when, when doing this was, um, well, what if I don't know what species it is? Will I get it? You know, can I, will they identify it for me? There's a little note box at the very bottom of this form. Type in that you would like to know if they're able to identify it. But I will say that they're not always able to identify them. Sometimes they have to have them in hand and be able to see the male genitalia in order for them to identify the species. They can be sort of complex. These are all pictures that people have taken um, through observations. And so, um, you know, your picture could be used in my next pollinator presentation. Another um, thing that you could do is, uh, this is our Pacific Northwest bumblebee atlas. So if you, you were like, those bumblebee butts are really calling my name. You've seen them in the little flowers. I get it, I'm there. Um, on the evening of May 17th, they will be doing a, uh, a training for this. It's an all online training. But the way it works is you adopt a grid cell in Washington, and then you commit to at least visiting that grid cell once, going out, learning, uh, trapping bumblebees, learning to identify them, and then submitting your observation. And the training will teach you about uh, how to do this. Yeah. Organic Materials Review Institute. Organic Materials Review Institute is OMRI. Thank you, sir. Um, and for folks in person, I do have, the, we have all sorts of resources for you. I not only have bumblebee and regular bee identify, uh, identification sheets, but I also have information on the bumblebee atlas. Um, another thing that you could do is speak up, use your voices. Um, advocate for your nurseries to minimize their use of pesticides and ask them not to purchase plants that have been contaminated with pesticides and fungicides. And so this was a study that came out in September of last year and it, milkweed plants bought at nurseries may expose monarch caterpillars to harmful pesticide results. And what it said, uh, they looked at milkweed plants at nurseries all throughout the United States multiple pesticides were detected in every single milkweed plant sample. And so that means, you know, we could be going out, we could be doing the really good thing, like I'm gonna support pollinators, I'm putting the plant in, and then we're killing the caterpillars because the plant's been, in, um, you know, infested with pesticides. And so um, even, and then the, the last part was really interesting, even plants that were labeled as wildlife friendly had pesticides. So advocating to your nurseries, I'm not interested in it, don't buy it, is a good way of using your voice. So how do how do these plants get infected? Is it because next to other plants? No, the, the growers are actually spraying them with it, or they're they're um they're growing them, they're growing them with it because they want them to be, you know, we want the monarchs to eat them, but we don't want uh the flies or the beetles to eat them. So to prevent the beetles from eating them, we put the pesticides on them. But you know, pesticides aren't always that explicit. And in organic, they when, if they, I think I see some plants and organic. Yeah, 
of the statue. Wasn't what part of what they found that it was getting into the seeds that were then being propagated later away from pesticides, uh, but they still had a different mm -hmm. like in the seeds. Yeah. So part of the problem is they want a perfect look looking plant in the store shelf. Yeah. If it's got any insect damage, it's not going to sell well. So you want to buy the plants that have insect damage. Yes, <laughs> there you go. You want to buy the plants that have insect damage. Not enough. Not enough to kill the plants. Just enough. Just that. Like we learned earlier. Um, and so the the end of this um, study said, what should the average person do if they want to support monarch conservation by planting milkweed? Plants should be purchased from nurseries who implement a robust approach to minimizing their reliance on pesticides, both the total number and the concentrations used. And I, I think it's interesting because, you know, monarch has received considerable attention. Um, essentially, I think a year and a half ago now, the Federal Fish and Wildlife Service, it, it was petitioned for endangered species listing, and they said, you know, we really want to list this, but we don't actually have enough financial resources to be able to protect this species. So, like, their population numbers are that low, but they're, they're, they're sort of the sexy species of the insect world. And so, you know, when you think about all of the other species that aren't getting the same kind of attention, um, it can be pretty disheartening. But Monarchs don't occur in Western Washington, so it's kind of wasting space planting milkweed here, aren't you? Uh, other insects will pollinate milkweed. So, oh, okay. I mean, in it, showy milkweed is our, our native species and it's very beautiful. Other insects will pollinate it, but don't, po don't plant it thinking that you're going to get monarchs because you won't. And then with that, do I have any questions? Yeah. So after talking about all, all of these pollinators, if you were to say like the top four or five for our region, like here in Tukwila, that would be good to try to support, um, that maybe we're trying to know a lot more crisis, like what, what would you say? These, 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 because these are, are really, they are the ultimate pollinator. Um, with their, their fuzzy little legs and, and their fuzzy little butts, they're catching all that pollen. And sometimes they, they'll, you'll even see bumblebees that have, they're called pollen packets, and they, they just have these thighs of pollen. Um, so the fuzzy, the fuzzy horned bumblebee, the two-toned bumblebee, these are, are, are ones that are more common that you might see in, the, in Tequila, South Seattle, down to Olympia area. Um, but really, all of our bees are important. Um, you know, our carpenter bees, our sweat bees, really all of the invertebrates. Um, I don't make me choose. <laughs> I have a couple of information for Clarence. Um, yeah. And they, the bees, the bumblebees, just, yeah. wow, just go for them. Yeah. And they, so uh, they said that the they have a couple of cone flowers or echinacea, and the bumblebees love them. They just go for them. Yeah. yeah. So for additional information, I recommend the Washington Butterfly Association. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a good group. They're actually meeting now, uh, first Wednesday of the month. But <laughs> that's a good group. If you want information on butterflies, that's where they'll get it. And second, your certification is from the state, right? Yep. You yep. can also do the National Wildlife Federation. You can. And I'd like to point out that Tequila was the fourth community in the nation to be certified. Wow. So for folks online, Tequila was the fourth community in the nation to be certified nationally through the National Wildlife Federation, which is pretty cool. Give yourselves a hand, Tequila. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Don. <laughs> Um, this, I've been told by many pollinator biologists, is sort of the Bible of attracting pollinators to your yard. It has a very specific focus on bees, but it does have um, other pollinators as well. Um, and so we'll drop the link for uh, in the chat for you if you're online. Um, but it's attracting native pollinators, and it's by the Exerce Society. Um, the Exerce Society is um, invertebrate conservation and they just have a load of resources like I go on their website and get lost 
and sometimes overwhelmed because of how many things they have that you can do to support pollinators. Very cool stuff. Oh, that goes after the uh, the mason bee. Uh, yeah, fly. yeah. So I didn't mention the Houdini fly that goes after the mason bee, and so that that is an issue. Um, and and folks have been we've been getting pollinator biologists all over the northwest have been getting reports of like the Houdini fly is cleaning out my mason bee house. Well, it's because yes, you need to clean out your mason bee house. You need to make it not so easy for the Houdini fly. So it's unfortunate. I would like to recommend a book if you want on butterflies, uh, Butterflies of Cascadia by Bob Pyle. It's an inch thick, so it's got quite a bit in it. But if you really want um, where their habitat range is in the Northwest, that, yeah. that's a good book. Butterflies of Cascadia by Bob Pyle. Um, I just wanted to add um, the low. So easy to do yard work, yard work for these guys is also deadheading those flowers at the end of the season and leaving mm -hmm. these natural stems because there's a lot more of them, which makes it harder for predators to find it quickly. Yeah. See, that's so perfect. That's why I don't know if they can do it. Um, so Nikki was saying our habitat at home coordinator, if you don't want to mess with the the mason bee box, deadhead your flowers and your stems, and then they can go and cocoon in there. And that makes it harder for predators to get to. I'm always a fan of easier. Think, you know, what is it? Working smarter rather than harder. Yeah, was there another? Yeah, I'm just. I know. I mean, we will work. But I'm also concerned about when you start thinking about biodiversity, um, other insects that are really necessary that don't have that that we have, mm -hmm. and you know, and what we should be doing to those. Pesticides is is I mean pesticides is a huge one. It's such a big one, but I mean it's you have to think like if you're creating habitat for for invertebrate pollinators, you're probably creating habitat for other invertebrates as well. Really, anything that we can do to restore or or um, have our habitat look similar to how they used to. I, I think it's maybe naive to think that they're gonna all look the exact same way, but whatever we can do to make our habitats look similar, we're going to help all of those other insects as well. And the other question I have is, I know that with me restoration, but we have this, you know, standard that everybody uses. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, uh, there's two rows everywhere. Yeah. So I'm just wondering the benefit of, you know, starting to broaden that out to like native meadow plants and some other like plants that maybe aren't more suited to kind of that overall um, plant material. Yeah. And so the question was um, sometimes uh, in your, you have like a, a native plant case where you get like six different plants that you're recommended to plant. Could we start incorporating more meadow plants? Yeah, absolutely. If your habitat was suited for it. Um, and so that, you know, we've had a lot of conifer encroachment on a lot of our, what, what used to be meadows. And so depending on what your space looks like, that could mean removing conifers. But then when you remove trees, you know, um, people don't always like it when you remove trees. Uh, we're, we, the WDFW had us a project going down um, in, uh, oh, I can't think of the county. I want to say Wakayakum County, um, where we're trying to restore meadow habitat to have organ spotted, uh, organ silver spot uh, be released. Currently, organ silver spot is extirpated from Washington, um, but we have to remove a lot of trees and we're getting a lot of questions about why are we removing the trees. And so, a lot of it's just, you know, we're talking to your neighbors about it. Like um, trees certainly have their time and place, but historically, a lot of our Puget lowlands used to be that that lush prairie meadow. Well, especially now. <laughs> I mean, trees are important, right? But, uh, you know, wetlands, I always like to say, wetlands are like a huge uh, carbon sequester as well. So there's, there's, 
gosh, there's so many different ways to do it, and we can't agree. I'm going to replace your lawn with a meadow. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you could. Um, the Center for, uh, oh gosh, Center for Native Lands Management has um, a native plant nursery out of Tenino, and you can get uh, you can get seeds from them, and you can create your own meadow. Center for Land Center for Natural Lands Management. Let's get that one I'll send out to everybody. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, we'll add that one. Great, thank you. Yeah. I've got to disagree on one point. You mentioned if the bees went away, we would too. All the major grains, wheat, rice, and corn are wind pollinated. They don't need bees. And so you go to the rest our fast food restaurant, the patty, the bun, and the french fries don't need bees. So we wouldn't starve, but our diet would get gross. <laughs> well, I was talking about it. The, the quote was in reference to all invertebrates. It wasn't just in reference to bees, but I think about you know, if invertebrates were to disappear, our food chains would literally collapse because they form the base of our food chains. And biodiversity is uh, it's ecosystem reliance. If we were to have no more species outside of humans, you know, there goes our plants, there goes our clean water, there goes our, our oxygen, like things would collapse. You don't no. think so? No. Yeah. Talking about pesticides, uh, we've got a big problem here in St. Louis because we have a lot of crows and the crows are digging up our, our grass to get to the grubs. Mm -hmm. And the only way that you can stop that is you have to put a pesticide on to kill the grubs. Pardon me, Crane is not an island. No, it's a grub. It's a little grub. Little white. Do you know what's called, Sharon? The invasive grub. I don't see all kinds of articles about it. Yeah, it's yeah, but you know, I'll tell you what is if you've got that in your in your uh, soil under your grass. Your grass is so toast anyway. So <laughs> to me, it's like I, I'm just like my mom and you know, yeah, because they're because they're go after the the grubs and then yeah. you can just repeat. So yeah. yeah. All right. Were there any online questions? Okay. Well, thanks everyone for joining today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, just for our online audience before they go, and thank you guys so much. I'm Nikki, I'm the Habitat Home Coordinator. She pointed to off screen a couple times. Um, this is our last hybrid uh, talk for the Tuckwilla Talks for this year. Um, we are doing one more event. We're doing a workshop on the first Wednesday of next month in May. It's going to be an urban birding workshop with our Watchable Wildlife Coordinator. Um, we're going to learn all about urban birds and how to identify them, and then we're going to go outside and go birding, which will be really, really fun. So I hope you guys join us for that in person if you're anywhere where you can reach Tagwilla. Otherwise, thank you all so much for being here. Yeah, thank you guys. Thank, thank you, you guys. to our online moderators. Thank you. That was